Hi, I'm Sarah. I work for the Civil Rights Division of the United States Department of Justice. My office is called the Immigrant and Employee Rights Section, or IER. IER enforces a part of the Immigration and Nationality Act that prohibits employment discrimination based on citizenship status and national origin. In addition to our enforcement work, we educate the public on this law to help avoid violations from occurring. The law that my office enforces prohibits four things. We'll go into more detail about each of these types of unlawful actions in today's presentation. Unfair documentary practices is the most common type of discrimination and many people don't even know it's illegal. IER operates a free employer hotline, which I'll reference throughout the presentation. You can call anonymously to ask questions about avoiding discrimination based on citizenship, immigration status, or national origin. The employer hotline number is 1-800-255-8155 or 1-800-237-2515 for those with hearing disabilities. The phone number appears at the end of the presentation. The first type of prohibited discrimination is discrimination based on citizenship status. The anti-discrimination law that IER enforces prohibits discrimination on the basis of citizenship or immigration status in hiring, firing, and recruitment or referral for a fee. The people who are protected under this particular part of the law are U.S. citizens, U.S. nationals, lawful permanent residents, and workers granted asylum or refugee status. For example, if an employer refuses to hire a person because the person has refugee status, or if an employer has a policy that limits hiring to U.S. citizens only with no legal justification. Is preference in hiring based on citizenship status ever permissible? Yes. For example, when a law, regulation, executive order, or government contract requires employers to place citizenship status restrictions on hiring. However, employers cannot impose additional hiring restrictions that are not actually required. For example, a federal contractor cannot have a U.S. citizens only hiring policy for all jobs when only certain jobs are covered by a citizenship restriction under the contract. Sometimes employers ask if they're required under the law IER enforces to hire someone who requires sponsorship to be able to work in the United States. Generally, employers can say they do not want to hire people that require visa sponsorship. Someone who requires sponsorship is not protected from this type of discrimination under the Immigration and Nationality Act. But keep in mind that this presentation is only discussing the Immigration and Nationality Act's anti-discrimination provision. Other federal, state, and local laws prohibit employment discrimination based on citizenship status. IER also investigates employment discrimination based on national origin. National origin discrimination is treating employees differently based on the country they come from, their ancestry, their accent, or because they appear to be from a certain country. For example, if a company fired a worker of Asian descent because the company wrongly believed Asian people are to blame for the COVID-19 pandemic. National origin discrimination can occur in the process of hiring or firing workers or in recruitment or referral of workers for a fee. Generally, IER has jurisdiction over employers that have four to 14 employees. The Equal Employment Opportunity Commission covers national origin discrimination with employers that have 15 or more employees. The law the EEOC enforces is broader and includes discrimination in terms or conditions of employment. Some national origin indicators are English skills, ancestry, clothing, country of birth, name, and accent. It's irrelevant if an employer's perception of national origin indicators is accurate or not. An example of national origin discrimination is refusing to hire anyone who is not a native English speaker, preferring to hire workers from a particular country, or not hiring someone because the person has a foreign accent, even though the person meets job requirements. The most common type of discrimination IER sees is unfair documentary practices, and many people don't realize it's illegal. Unfair documentary practices refer to discrimination based on citizenship status or national origin, 
that often occurs when getting proof of someone's permission to work in the United States, such as in the Form I-9 and E-Verify processes. What are unfair documentary practices? They occur when an employer requests more or different documents than are required, rejects documents that appear genuine, or specifies certain documents from an employee based on citizenship status or national origin. A common example of this is an employer who says, oh, you're a permanent resident? Well, then I need to see your green card. The purpose of the Form I-9 is to establish an, an employee's identity and permission to work in the United States. The form is not to verify an employee's particular immigration status. U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, or USCIS, is responsible for the Form I-9 and has many free resources to help you complete it, such as the I-9 Central website and the M-274 Handbook for Employers. My office, IER, does not administer the Form I-9. IER investigates allegations of discrimination in the I-9 process. Instructions for the Form I-9 are available online. The Form I-9 also has the lists of acceptable documents, which describe the documents employees can present to establish their identity and permission to work. It's important for employers to make sure that employees have access to all pages of the instructions and the lists of acceptable documents. Employees can also show receipts in some circumstances. I-9 Central includes a lot of information on acceptable documents and receipts, including examples of the different types of acceptable documents. You can also call IER's free employer hotline if you have questions about acceptable Form I-9 documents. Consider calling IER before rejecting a worker's I-9 documentation. The wait times on our employer hotline are short and calls can be anonymous. Section one is the portion of the Form I-9 the worker completes after offer and acceptance of employment. The worker should fill out section one on or before the first day of work. In section one of the I-9, these are the four citizenship statuses workers can choose from. The first three are specific statuses, U.S. citizen, U.S. national, and lawful permanent resident. The fourth box is a broad category that includes anyone who has permission to work in the United States who is not a U.S. citizen, U.S. national, or lawful permanent resident. Some people who will check the fourth box, like asylum applicants, are temporarily authorized to work, and some have permission to work that doesn't expire, like workers granted asylum or refugee status. The fourth box includes a field for a worker to enter the expiration date if they are temporarily authorized to work. If your employee's permission to work doesn't expire, they should mark NA there, even if they show Form I-9 documentation that expires. For example, even though someone granted refugee status may show you, may choose to show you an employment authorization document, the expiration date of the em employment authorization document is unrelated to the refugee's permission to live and work in the United States. The same holds true for some other statuses as well. For example, US citizens still have permission to live and work in the United States, even if their passport expires. Employers cannot ask any worker to present documentation for Section 1. So, for example, an employer shouldn't ask someone for an immigration document or a document with an expiration date. Also, don't ask workers to provide proof of their USCIS or A number. Proof is not required. Remember that an employee is not required to show documents that prove the status they have selected because the purpose of the Form I-9 is to establish that workers are authorized to work and not to provide proof of their specific status. An employer completes Section 2 within three business days of an employee's first day of work. Workers must present their documents to the employer for this process to occur. This is the list of acceptable documents that workers and employers use for the Form I-9. When verifying a worker's documentation, employers cannot tell any worker to present a specific document Employers cannot ask for more documents than are necessary, and employers cannot reject valid and acceptable documents. An employer's lack of familiarity with a particular document is not an excuse to reject it. 
Some examples of problems we see are employers asking non-citizens for proof of their immigration status. For example, asking a lawful permanent resident for a permanent resident card. Another example is employers not accepting valid documents like an identification card together with an unrestricted social security card from a worker who they think is from another country. Employers rejecting valid documents like an I-94 with an asylum stamp because the employer has never seen that document before and is a little more suspicious because the worker wasn't born in the US. Those are just some examples. Employers and workers can call my office with questions about what documents are acceptable. You can refer to the latest USCIS resources on the subject, such as the I-9 Central website or the M274 Handbook for Employers. You can call IER's free hotline or USCIS's free employer line with questions about acceptable documentation. Please note that these rules are for verifying people's identity and permission to work. There are of course situations where an employer must ask a worker for a specific document, like when a company asks a new employee for a driver's license because the job involves driving duties. In that case, the request for the license is for a different reason, not to verify someone's permission to work. Sometimes an employer might need to re-verify someone's permission to work. For example, if a worker shows an employment authorization document that later expires. Workers get to choose what acceptable documentation to present for Form I-9 re-verification. Workers do not need to show or present the same kind of document they presented when they started their job. Employers must accept any valid List A or List C document that the worker chooses to present. For example, if I choose to show an employment authorization document when I start a job, I can decide to show an unrestricted social security card when the employment authorization document expires if I want to. Regarding re-verification and List B documents, employers should not attempt to re-verify a List B document because you're only re-verifying permission to work. Re-verification is not about re-verifying a person's identity. Employers should not re-verify certain documents, such as permanent resident cards, List B documents, or any documents presented by US citizens or US nationals. I emphasize that employers should not re-verify a lawful permanent resident card, also known as a green card, when it expires. Many employers get this wrong. Visit I-9 Central or call IER with any questions about proper Form I-9 re-verification. Every day, IER receives questions about the Form I-9 on our hotline. For example, we often hear about situations where employers reject employment authorization documents that have been extended past the expiration date listed on the card. I'll talk about these EAD extensions in more detail on the next slide, but the main point is to be aware that an EAD might be valid even though the expiration date on the card has already passed. Permanent resident cards or green cards may have some extension as well. On the Form I-9 lists of acceptable documents, List B contains a broad category that covers many documents. The second category of List B documents is an identity card issued by a federal, state, or local government agency or body, provided in, it includes a photo or information such as name, date of birth, gender, height, eye color, and address of the person. Note that a photo is not required unless the employer uses E-Verify. Instead, the document could contain a physical description of the individual. For example, an, a person granted refugee status can present a transportation boarding letter. It fits the parameters. Another acceptable example is a municipal library card with a photo or a description of the person. There are other identification documents that might fall under this List B document. Similarly, List C documents include a broad category that also encompasses many documents. There are many documents that fall into this broad category. For example, a certificate of naturalization or an asylee form I-94. Workers are also allowed to present receipts for lost, damaged, or stolen documents for the form I-9. 
Generally, these receipts are valid for 90 days. At the end of the 90 day period, workers will present their replacement document, but they also can present other acceptable documentation if they don't have the replacement document. A machine readable immigrant visa is normally valid for one year after the person's arrival in the US. Employers must look at the date on the stamp and not the date on the visa to determine the expiration date. You can call IER with questions. There are many kinds of forms I-94. Some can be used for the form I-9 and some can't be used. Some EADs are eligible for extensions. There are different kinds of extensions and the rules vary. For some EAD extensions, it's not necessary to show additional documentation. For other kinds of EAD extensions, it's necessary to show an I-797C receipt notice. I-9 Central and the Handbook for Employers have information about the different types of extensions to help an employer when an employee presents their extended EAD. You can call IER with questions about EAD extensions too. Sometimes a worker can use a Form I-94 to show their permission to work. The purpose of this visual is to point out that Forms I-94 can have different formats. One version is a card that the U.S. government gives to the individual. Another would be a printout that the person can access online. A Form I-94 can also be attached to a Form I-797. All of these versions are considered Forms I-94. Different categories of non-citizen workers may have a Form I-94, and depending on the type of Form I-94, it might be used for the Form I-9. Sometimes the worker will need to present another document together with the Form I-94. Let's highlight a few types of Forms I-94 along with their relationship to Form I-9. There are several types of Forms I-94. Some are used for the Form I-9 and some are not. A Form I-94 can have different uses depending on the worker's immigration status. This table just shows a few examples. See I-9 Central for more information on Forms I-94 and their utility for the Form I-9. In addition to the examples on this slide, an I-94 and a passport can be used as a list a document for some workers, but workers granted asylum or refugee status, permanent residents, and the Afghan and Ukrainian humanitarian parolees listed in this table don't have to show a passport with their I-94 in order to use it for the Form I-9. Form I-9 rules can be complicated for employers and workers. Please call us with questions and consider calling IER before you reject a worker's document for the Form I-9. If a worker has sufficient documentation to complete Section 2 of the Form I-9, an employer can hire the worker and the worker can begin work, even if the worker has not received a Social Security number. The Social Security Administration the Internal Revenue Service, the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, and the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission all provide guidance to employers on this matter. My office can point you to the guidance. The U.S. Department of Homeland Security administers the E-Verify program. E-Verify compares Form I-9 data with government records. If an employer uses E-Verify, the proper sequence is to hire the worker complete the Form I-9, and then run the worker through E-Verify. IER does not administer E-Verify, but we do investigate discriminatory use of the program. E-Verify does not allow the employer to ask employees for specific documentation. E-Verify users must use E-Verify consistently for all new hires and not selectively. Employers cannot request specific documents for E-Verify or the Form I-9. All right, E-Verify changes the Form I-9 process in three ways. One, if a worker chooses to present a list B document, it must have a photograph. Two, the Form I-9 makes the social security number field voluntary, but workers must fill it in for E-Verify employers. Some new immigrants may have acceptable documents to present for the Form I-9, but they haven't yet received their social security number. In this case, the Department of Homeland Security directs the employer to delay creating the employee's E-Verify case and allow the worker to start and continue working while they wait to receive their social security number. 
When the employee gets a social security number, the employer can indicate in E-Verify that the reason it creates the case more than three days after the worker's start date was because the worker was waiting to receive their social security number. You can find this option in a drop-down list. Three, E-Verify employers have to copy certain Form I-9 documents, US passports, permanent resident cards, and employment authorization documents. Employers who do not use E-Verify can make copies if they wish, but should do so consistently, regardless of citizenship, immigration status, or national origin. Usually, the E-Verify case result is work authorized. Sometimes a tentative non-confirmation or mismatch results. A mismatch is not proof that the employee lacks permission to work. Some mismatches are due to typos, so check to make sure there are none and ask the worker to make sure the information is correct before referring the case. If there's a mistake, employers close the old E-Verify case and create a new one with the correct information. If there is no mistake and the worker decides to take action to resolve the mismatch, don't use the mismatch as a reason to fire or suspend the worker. Once referred, the worker has eight government work days to contact the Department of Homeland Security or the Social Security Administration to start the process of resolving the mismatch. If a worker receives an E-Verify final non-confirmation, the employer may choose to terminate the worker. However, if you or your employee believe that a final non-confirmation is an error, you or your employee can contact the E-Verify hotline for help. People are protected from retaliation or intimidation for asserting rights under the law that IER enforces. This includes intimidation, threats, coercion, and retaliation. Some examples are protection for people who file a charge with IER, cooperate with an IER investigation, contest action that they think may be illegal under this law, call IER's hotline, or otherwise assert their rights under the law IER enforces. Workers or their representatives can file charges of discrimination with IER, which we then investigate. IER also has the authority to open independent investigations if we have a reasonable belief that an employer has committed a violation. If IER does not have reasonable cause to believe discrimination occurred, we'll dismiss the charge. When IER believes a violation occurred, we will try to resolve the matter, typically through a settlement process. If IER is not able to reach a settlement with an employer, we can seek authority to file a complaint before an administrative law judge. When individuals file charges with IER, they also have the right to file their own complaints before the judge, regardless of what happens with IER's investigation. Some outcomes of an IER settlement agreement are that the worker can be hired or rehired, the worker could receive back pay, training for the employer to avoid future violations of the law. The government might monitor the employer to avoid future violations of the law. The employer might need to make any necessary policy changes, and the employer might pay civil penalties to the government. Here are some common reasons why employers and workers call the IER hotlines. Information on avoiding discrimination under the Immigration and Nationality Act's anti-discrimination provision. Information on the Form I-9. Information on E-Verify. Information on hiring someone with permission to work who is still waiting to be issued their social security number, such as the guidance from different federal agencies on how to onboard a worker who is waiting to receive their social security number. Information on US citizenship requirements. Employers who believe a position is required to be limited to US citizens should review the legal requirements carefully. Workers who believe a job position is limiting hiring to US citizens only can call IER if they believe it may be in error. IER has worker and employer hotlines that anyone in the public can call with questions. We don't provide legal advice, but we do provide guidance and callers can remain anonymous. My office often informally intervenes on a worker's behalf. For example, if a worker calls IER's hotline because an employer is incorrectly rejecting a document, IER might offer to contact the company to share information on which documents are acceptable. 
IER's website has additional educational resources and technical assistance letters. Thank you for listening.